Hi, everyone. Welcome to Infinite Life, Infinite Wisdom, where we talk all things after life. I'm your host, Susan Graw. I'm an intuitive medium, soul healer, author, and speaker. Today, we're going to talk about empaths and what it means to be an empath and how to manage through our journey as an empath. So let's take a deep dive. Empaths are typically described as someone who feels the emotions and feelings of others. They are highly sensitive individuals that respond and react to things in their environment that maybe others might not feel or sense or react to. And therefore, they have a lot of emotional whirlwind going on at very high speeds. And that energy is dispersing at a denser energy in your environment. So it's coming on very dense and heavy. That's why most empaths are chronically tired, because they're taking in so much from the outside world. No amount of sleep seems to counteract that fatigue. Um, Empaths are, there's a lot of positives to being an empath, and we'll talk about that. Right now, let's talk about why we feel worse when we are basically open. And that's because there's no barriers to that intense barrage of sensations that comes in. Most empaths and psychics will self-medicate to create an artificial barrier, a kind of numbing, so to speak, uh, in order to curb all the effects of feeling everything around them. There's symptoms of being an empath, but let's talk about the unusual symptoms that you might be experiencing. Um, Precognizant or lucid dream. Sometimes we dream during the day as well. Knowing things we couldn't know or couldn't have logically known, and it seems like a surprise when we find out that we were right. We catch moods like we catch colds. Everybody's mood comes in, boom, boom, boom. It's happening all over the place. Developing illnesses that aren't contagious. I once had to get my uh, wisdom teeth re- removed because my boyfriend had his coming out. Literally felt it. This was many, many years ago. Had no clue what I was feeling and experiencing, but I was going through what he was going through. And so it was very profound in my journey. And I guess that I was an empath. I just thought, I cared. But what was happening is is that I was becoming more and more uh, struggling, I guess I want to say, instead of becoming or struggling with more and more difficulties of being in this world. I was a vacuum. It was like everything was sucking into me. Any kind of smile, any kind of sadness, any kind of joy, any kind of, of darkness. And I didn't know how to handle that. Um, I didn't need validation from others, but I needed to understand that I was feeling this energy and what that meant for me. And it took me a long, long time to be able to find solitude and recoup whenever I was out in public. Um, I was around people and I can guarantee you, I wouldn't be relaxing. I'd be alert, picking up everything. I'd be around the other person, not knowing what what to do with their feelings, what they were thinking, what they were experiencing. And it didn't matter if I wanted to be in their energy or not. I was in their energy. Social interactions were so draining for me. And I didn't know how to relax and, and be in environments where I wasn't alone. And so I didn't quite fit in. So if people were going to parties, I'd go, but I always felt all the energy. If someone didn't like me, oh, I knew it. I knew it right away. And I didn't know how to recharge myself. And I didn't have the self-esteem to know that I was lovable, even if someone else didn't feel that way. So when I was picking up that energy, I was all over the place. It was extremely painful. I wasn't choosy about the company I kept. I just wanted anyone to love me. Just love me. That's all I need. If you just love me, I'll be okay. That's all I need is to be loved. I got bored easily and I needed constant stimulation, but it was my stimulation, not stimulation from the outside world. I had trouble filtering negative emotional stimuli. Quickly as things would come into me, I'd try to flip it over and make it positive, but I had a lot of trouble doing that. Being an empath is like being wide open. You are open to every emotion around you. And people will probably call you too sensitive. 
And the answer to that is they are right. You are a sensitive. I am a sensitive. And so it's harder and harder for us to do things and be around groups of people. Our potential feels like a lie to us. So we feel like posers because we never really feel good, but we can help so many people. And so we think we're deceiving them when in truth, we are givers to the world. We're not takers. So we're always giving. We are able to help people even when we're struggling with the topic. Very interesting process to go through. We are sensitive to all stimulation. And so it shakes us up when things are not at peace. There are times in my life where I thought being an empath was the most negative thing that I could possibly be. Number one, I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand it. But also just feeling heavy. I always felt heavy and I never felt good enough. I knew what people were thinking in a weird kind of way, not their exact thoughts, but definitely if it had to do with me or if they weren't kind people, I was very aware I didn't really understand the world and the lack of kindness in the world. It was hard for me to function in that negative energy. Um, The greater the gifts that you have, the harder it is to go through this world. So the goal of being an empath is to own it, to learn about it, to thrive in it, and to own it. Hard to do. So let's talk about some steps. The first thing is to recognize that you have this gift and it's not a curse. As much as it might feel like that in the beginning, I'd like to think about it this way. The greater the gift potential for positive impact, conversely, the greater the potential for destruction. And what that means for me is that being a gifted person, I had the pleasure of reaching my potential and seeing others' potential, but I would take in all the messiness, all the muddied stuff. And so I wasn't sure good or bad, or I was I was taking in wrong. And so I would destruct inside thinking I'm such a bad person. I'm thinking bad of people. I'm judging them instead of recognizing that that was my way of having discernment. So it got very messy for me. I also had difficulty honing in on the skill because I didn't know it was a skill. So I guess it seemed darker than it needed to. And in a light worker's world, we're heroes. We're grand. We are bright. We are light. We are love. But in the real world, in the outside world, we are emotional. We are too sensitive. We are um, not enough. We literally feel everything and therefore people are uncomfortable around us. And so we have a lot of struggles. If you're an empath and you haven't thought of, of or had a moment of thinking about suicide or struggled with depression, I'd be rather surprised. We lose a lot of great children, men and women to suicide because they're so highly sensitive. And they did their best, but it was all too much for them. They didn't know what an empath was. They didn't understand who they were, and they didn't know what to do with the feelings that were coming in because empathic energy is extremely overwhelming. Um, it was It's hard for people to follow their joy, their happiness, when they don't know why they feel all the sadness around them. So it's our job to stimulate ourselves, to move forward, to find what we love, uh, do everything we can to bring joy to our lives, not settle for less than what we're worth, which is really hard because we attract narcissistic energies. And I'm going to tell you why we attract them. It is commonplace for an empath to be with a narcissist because we can feel, F-I-L-L, feel, feel other people's emptiness. And we're not looking for them to fill our, so we are great givers, but narcissists have an empty hole inside of them and they love to be filled by ego. And we're just good at filling everything. So (laughs) feeling and filling everything. So we would naturally settle into someone who's narcissistic and a narcissist is someone that has me first. That's how they think. Me first, they're gaslighters. They twist the truth. They confuse us. And that way they get away with being whatever they choose to be. They actually don't have a good self-esteem. They have a strong ego, very strong ego, but they don't have good sense of self. So we fill them up. We get in our highest state of vibration when someone needs us and we start filling them. 
that we have to be very cautious about the narcissistic people we bring into our lives. That doesn't mean that they're not valuable beings. They have a lot to teach us, but it does mean that they can harm us. We are always living in the highest state of vibration. When we're not in that state, we're usually depressed. So we have to be very careful to have healthy spiritual practices, to care for ourselves, to recharge ourselves, um, to ourselves time to recover, have recovery, and not allow others to drain us. So we go through our life allowing people to drain us, trying to recover it, and then the next day it's repeat on steroids. Um, so living with your purpose is really the only thing you need to do to help you with that. Finding our purpose is a whole nother level. Uh, in order to find our purpose, we have to look internally and not feel what's going on around us, which is extremely hard. We tune out our inner feeling so that we can have empathic energy for others. Turning down that dial is extremely difficult. And there are all sorts of exercises to do to turn down that empathic dial and create barriers, tune out and, and not be in everyone else's energy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in this podcast. But living our purpose and being in the flow is very hard when we don't know how to turn the dial down of everyone else's need. I didn't know that my gift had an intuitive aspect to it. So I was always vibrating at a higher state and paying attention to everyone else's gift, everyone else's needs, everyone else's everything and not aiding myself. So it hindered me on my journey. If someone didn't love me, I didn't understand. I would say, why don't they love me? I, I'm so good. I, I'm kind. I'm, I'm all these things. And I have to say that we are not altruistic completely. We want to be loved so we feel better about ourselves, right? And that's sometimes our motives. Or we want to give so that we feel valuable or that we are loved. And there's a motive behind that. It isn't just, oh, I'm giving because I'm such an altruistic person. So we can get very unhealthy in our empathic energy. It's like um, wanting to fix other people at the expense of ourselves. And that can be very unhealthy. So I have this little saying that says, don't do for others what they can and should do for themselves. Once we recognize that we're doing that, we can remove ourselves and get in our healthy space again. So one of the ways to do that is to find what you love and using your potential, that electric energy, that impasse all these can access to accelerate towards what you love. Instead of bringing people towards you, go towards what you love. We bring everyone around us on the ride. And it, although it can be a great gift, it can also be very negative for our sense of peace and self. Being an empath is one of the hardest energies I've had to deal with inside my being. So I guess I can say it's got some darkness to it. But what I know about it is that that's how I thrive. So in order to thrive as an empath and, empath and recognize my gift, I have to be my own superstar. I was always in that overstimulated world, being so sensitive to everything around me that I couldn't be my superstar. I couldn't empower myself. I knew I had a higher calling and I knew I needed to do something amazing and wonderful for the world, but I had no clue what that looked like because I was so busy trying to heal others and help others that I didn't even know I needed healing. I used to have these aha moments when somebody would be going through something and I'd say, oh my goodness, I totally understand what they're feeling right now. And then I'd beat myself up because I'm supposed to be the helper. And what's wrong with me? And yet I'd be telling them there's nothing wrong with them and they just need to do some healing. So I had a really hard time giving myself my own advice and being gentle with myself, with my processes of helping others. I didn't know how to keep things clean and uncluttered. I blocked my flow of energy all the time because I didn't know how not to. So the energy would feel stagnant in a room and I'd be putting walls up, but I couldn't keep them up because I wanted so badly to be that person that helped others. I was shy and I could be very... Um, non-responsive, even though I was feeling every single bit of energy that was coming into the room. But I didn't know how to help myself. 
So if you came in front of me, I could help you. And I did that through being a therapist, but I never knew how to help myself. So it was like a debilitating poison for me when I was in a place that there were unhealthy people around me because I just needed them to love me. And you know, unhealthy people don't always love us. And in fact, not everyone's going to love us. But I didn't understand that. I thought that being lovable made me lovable. And so I would fight to be loved and fight to be seen. I didn't know how to be seen for who I was because I didn't see me. And so I had to learn to start recognizing what I was needing to recharge and what I was as a human. My soul was always open. And just picture that for a moment. You've got this beautiful, tender soul, and it's always open to all the damage and energy in the world. Now, our soul doesn't get damaged, but as it's coming in, it's going to my heart space and it's going to my spirit. You ever hear the word or the sentence that people say, um, maybe you have a horse, just break its spirit and you'll be okay. It'll do what you want it to do. Um, or a child, you need to break the spirit of that child. That kind of information makes me sick to my stomach. Because our spirit is so important. It is what defines us, not our soul. Our soul heals us, but our spirit defines us. And so my spirit would be hurt. And it was huge, huge energy coming in. And I was alerted of it, but I didn't know what was alerting me. I didn't know what to do with it. And so I would go back and, and keep trying and trying and trying to be loved by the people who didn't love me. I didn't know how to tell people to stop hurting me because I was allowing myself to hurt me. And so I needed to learn how to take care of myself in this vast energy that was spinning around me. Energy was like a tornado to me. I know for those of you who are empathic, you're understanding what I'm saying. We're the kind of people that are in the grocery store and someone will look into our eyes and start telling us all the pain they're carrying everything that's ever happened to them. Um, socially, we get drained instantly. So that would drain us even in the grocery store. There was nowhere to go. So that's why we started to, or I started to become alone and, and be around nature. But then I needed people so badly to love me and approve of me. And so I would be out there doing that unhealthy codependency. And what that means for me is there's a weed in the South that is the most beautiful weed I've ever seen. I cannot describe it. And I was driving through the South with my husband and I said, oh my God, that plant is so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. And he said, yeah, it is. But the problem with it is it grows on the trees and all it does is smother everything and it kills it. And at that moment, as an adult woman that had been working on her codependency issues and my empathic energy and how to separate those two, I thought to myself, oh my God, that's codependency for me. It's beautiful and I can do so much to help others. But on the same breath, I would take that codependency and smother and do for others what they should and could do for themselves. And then I didn't understand that I was smothering them and that's why they would pull away. I just wanted to fix them. And what I did was is I took away their right to learn on their own, their sense of self and dignity because I thought I knew what was best. So I had to learn that I didn't know what was best for others, that I didn't even really know what was best for myself. And I started doing that by becoming more choosy about the company that I kept. Now, it's very difficult to understand this, but an empath does a pack egoism. It's unbearable for us to be around. Narcissism we want to fix, 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 and we're un in an unbearable state of mind. We can literally see the vacuum it creates, sucking our attention and our energy toward them. So we smile and we act as if everything's okay, and we just want to hear that we're beautiful and we're enough, and of course, we don't receive that. So when I realized that I was doing that in most of my relationship, it was as if someone was standing in front of me yelling at me, stop needing back validation from me. You're not going to get it. And I realized that I needed to begin 
validating myself, which was very difficult. So uh, here's an example of my empathic journey. I was wanting to have this boy that I liked when I was young. It was really important to me that he liked me. And I would trip over myself. And I did everything for him. But I was never enough. And I couldn't understand it. Why doesn't he like me? What's wrong with me? I'm not, I'm not uncared for. I, I look okay. I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm giving. I just smother him with my need. I was so needy because I needed to know I was lovable, capable, and worthy. And I didn't know that. And when I realized I wasn't aware of my worthiness, I made a decision to tell him I didn't want to see him anymore. Now, I was a young a teenager, uh, but this was what I would call my first love. And I said to him, I don't want to date you anymore and I don't want to see you anymore. And he said, why? And I said, because I don't know how to love me. I'm too busy loving you. And that was a huge statement for me to say. And that's exactly what an empath feels. We don't know how to love us because we're too busy loving you. Think about it. He ended up saying, but I'm in love with you and I don't want you to leave me and I need you to stay. Uh, Please don't do this. And of course, I sucked right back in. But you know what the truth was is that he had changed his way of thinking. I think he realized that I had really affected this woman who does everything for me and who loved me or this young girl. And I, I don't want to lose it. But I never knew he felt that way till I stood up for me and created a, an intense barrier to the barrage of sensations that I had of needing to fix him, take care of him, heal him. I didn't know how to curb it. I was just so needing. That's how I, the, the word I want to use. I needed him to love me. I didn't realize that I needed to love me. So when you're an empath, your body will be processing the emotional world. And it's at such a high speed that you're at such a high vibration energetically that you only have one way to go, and that's crack. Well, that's pretty scary. So we'd be vibrating so high that we exhaust ourselves and then boom, we're crashing and we feel depressed and alone and lonely. And we don't know why all of a sudden we're feeling depressed because our senses tell us that everything's okay. And yet here we are, we've been out in the world for three or four days or maybe sometimes an hour and we come home and we're just fatigued. So then we have to rejuvenate and rebuild our energy. I love being an empath. I would never change it for anything. But I remember being a young girl and looking at the girls who just didn't care. They were so popular. And I wasn't. And they didn't care. They didn't care if they hurt you. They didn't care how they behaved. They didn't care if they were liked by the boys and everybody liked them. And I used to think to myself, I want to be just like them. I don't want to care. Today in my life, I'm so happy that I do care. I'm so happy that I decided that wouldn't have worked for me anyway if I tried not to care. But I'm so happy that I didn't attempt that because my empathic energy is my beauty. It's what makes me valuable to me. Obviously, it it gives value to the outside world, but it made me valuable to me. And I hope you start to recognize that your empathic energy is giving you value. The sensations that come in are so physical. They're not just emotionally coming in. We can go places and we come home and we're shaking. Or someone puts us on the spot and we begin to shake because we know they're looking for what's wrong with us, not what's right with us. And I used to tell myself throughout my journey, um, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I used to say it over and over. And then I started to learn that I need you to say, this is what's right with me. I am love and I want to give love. And that is not ugly. That is not bad. That is not wrong. It is beautiful. And it opened a gateway for me to recognize that I could walk in love regardless of what someone else did and learn to block out that negative energy that said I wasn't worthy and enough. Because people project their poor energy of themselves onto us. 
And I, I think that happens whether we're empathic or not. And an empath takes it in. An empath believes because you said it makes it true, because you think it makes it true. And what I've learned in my life is because someone says it doesn't make it true. And because they think it doesn't make it true. And also because I think it or say it doesn't make it true, which relieves me because I will tell you that a lot of my life, I didn't see the beauty of me. And so I was spending a great deal of time beating myself up and harming myself. I was never worthy. I was never enough. So what I learned to do was stand in front of the mirror and tell myself, you're worthy, you're lovable, you're capable, you're enough. And I have to tell you, when I started doing that, I would sob. And, and, and then I went through an anger stage. You are lovable. I mean, I could just feel the anger coming out of me, the pain coming out of me. And I would, I just kept continuing to do it and continuing to do it. And then I started doing it when I went to sleep at night too. I added that in. And one day I woke up and I looked in that mirror and the reflection looking back at me was someone who loved me. And I looked at myself and said, I am worthy. I am capable. I am enough. In fact, I'm a beautiful soul. And anyone who steps into my world is fortunate to have me. I never want to cause harm. I never want to do damage. I might, but it's not my motive. I have good motives in this world. And when I recognize that part of me, everything changed. But I'm going to tell you, it took enormous pain to get there. It took going through bad relationships. It took standing up for myself when I was frightened and terrified to do so. Now, I was a very strong woman with very strong opinions, but that was on the outside. Inside, I was afraid. And I was hypersensitive to all that energy. So if they didn't like me, I, I couldn't understand. And so I would blame me. It had to be me. It couldn't be them. And that's how I thought in this world. Children that are empathic energies are usually bullied. They usually do everything in the world to fit in. They have trouble finding that one best friend. And that's all they ever wanted was that one best friend. They are misunderstood and they are not taught to redirect because their parents don't understand. So for you parents out there that have children that sound a little bit like me and how I was, I want to really encourage you to step into their energy and learn to teach them their value. Learn about empathic energy. Learn what it's like to be an empath. You can look it up on the computer. You can study it, but learn about it. There's nothing wrong with your child that they don't fit in. And in fact, that's what's right with them. They have more to give, more to offer. They are the healers in the world. When I was on the other side, I saw the angelic presence working on the empath soul. And I was wondering what they were doing. And they said, they're expanding the empathic soul. And I said, why? And they said, because they're going to go through more and they're going to need a lot more energy in their soul to deal with pain of their spirit and their heartbreak. And I said, why? Why did they have to go through more? And they said, because that teaches them how to help others. And that's how they learn how to love themselves. So all this barrage of getting beaten up and all this pain of, of being not sitting in taught me who I was. And that's mind-blowing to me. So if you have a child that's subdued or is shut down, or is telling you they don't feel love, they don't feel like. They're the kid that when you're mad and you and they ask you, are you mad at me? And you say, no, I'm not mad at you, but you are. They're the kid that's going to say to you, I know you are. I know you're mad at me. I can feel it. I can feel it. That's the impact. That's the child that carries that strong knowing. And that's a beautiful energy. But our world is not based in empathic energy. Our world is filled with selfishness, not selflessness, and taking, not giving, unless you're with an empath. So I call it the pendulum, but honestly what it is, is have you ever been 
the fair and been in those boats that um, they take you up really high and then they bring you down and they take you up high the other way. Always picture an impasse sitting in the center, trying to be centered and balanced and off the boat goes and they go up on one side, selfishness, down to the center, up on the other side, selflessness. And what happens is, is whenever an empath feels that they are not being selfless, they feel they're being selfish. So there is no balance. The middle of that boat, when they're stopped, when you get done swinging to and fro and back and forth and, and you stop in that ride, you're in self-care at that moment. And that's where we need to be. We are not selfish because we aren't being selfless. And that's a hard lesson to learn. We are in self-care. And self-care is not selfish. But we tell ourselves it is. And so do your children. If I'm not giving, 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 I'm being selfish. If I'm not letting that person step all over me, I'm being selfish. If I stand up for myself, I'm being selfish. If I get on that ride all the time, and I have to get myself back down to the center and take a deep breath and say, because I am taking care of myself does not make me selfish. Now that's an intense barrage of sensations, right? I mean, the anxiety behind that. I don't really know I'm not being selfish because I'm in self-care. I'm caring for myself. I'm not causing harm to someone else. Selfish people take, take, take. An empath doesn't do that. They can never be selfish. Every time they try to take, they feel guilty and they give it back or they give more to that person. So how can they possibly be selfish? And when I recognized that I wasn't a selfish individual, no matter what anyone said, because they said it didn't make it true, I was able to find peace inside myself. I was able to actually take care of me and say, no, I'm not going to give my kid all my money and I'll go shop at Target so they can go shop at Nordstrom's, which by the way, I did my whole life. And that's just an example. That's that I was overwhelmed by the fact as I look back on my journey that I always came last. And I never wanted my children to learn that, but I think they did. And they had to work really hard at not coming last because I came last. And so they learned a great deal from, from me about that. I had to learn to put myself first and not feel selfish and ugly. Well, that was a challenge. It still is. Speaking my truth has become my motto. Speak your truth, Susan. Speak your truth. If you're not happy with the situation, speak your truth. If you need to get out, speak your truth. If you need something from someone, speak your truth. Speak up. That's really hard to do in your empathic energy because we believe our truth is not valuable. We believe that our truth is needy, and that's not true. So I'm going to ask you as you go through this journey, this up and down roller coaster, this confusing part of being empathic in your energy, that you learn that you are valuable, lovable, capable, worthy. You are enough. And being an empath is your greatest super. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope we can touch on this this again. Don't forget that I have SpeakPipe. So if you want to go to my website and ask me a question, I'll be happy to answer it. And someone asked me, uh, her name is Frida, and she asked me about leaving her body when she was young and what that meant for her. That's called astral projection. And we lift from our bodies to see the circumstances around us. And that's a gift. And not everyone can do that or knows how to do that. So for her, it happened randomly and she was confused by it. If you work it and continue to work it, you will learn how to do that on your own without it just being random, like anything. So that's what it's called. It's nothing to be afraid of. And you shared in your voicemail that it taught you that there was an afterlife. And so what a great gift. Keep working it. Even though you're older now, keep working it and you'll find that you have control over it and it will be a great gift for you. Everyone, please know that they are only a heartbeat away. Take care of you.